Today's television gets its programs from all over the place. They come into our living rooms from over the airwaves, from cables underground, and from satellites orbiting in outer space. Our TVs can be as tiny as wristwatches, or fill an entire room with brilliant colors and stereo sound. And that's not all. The hearing impaired can read the words to their favorite shows, children can play their favorite video games, and we can see our favorite movies time and again. I remember the real early days of television back in the mid-50s. All the shows were in black and white, and we only had three channels to pick from, and they only broadcast during certain daytime hours. And the station's equipment used to break a couple of times a week. Right in the middle of a show, your, your picture would go blank or the sound would go dead. And that would be that. I'm glad that doesn't happen today. We'd miss our favorite shows. It wasn't too bad. We half expected it. But the best part would be when the actors made mistakes or forgot their lines. You see, most of the shows and commercials were done live, right in the studio. I remember watching a peanut butter commercial. The announcer was telling us how smoothly the peanut butter spread when he ripped the bread right in half. And he had to continue saying his lines. Another time, right at the end of a long, exciting mystery show, the detective was explaining how the murder was committed. And he forgot the name of the murderer, so he said, you know, whatchamacallit did it. We never found out who the killer actually was, but we were laughing so hard that it didn't really matter. It used to be if you wanted to see a certain movie, you had to make sure you got to the theater within a week or so, or the show would change and you would miss it. And that would be that. Not anymore, though. That's right. VCRs have changed all that forever. You can rent movies for a night or two, buy them, or tape them off television. In a way, VCRs let us control our TVs. We can pick the movie we want to watch or hook the VCR to a video camera and watch our own home movies. It's pretty easy to see what's going to happen with movies in the next couple of years. Just look at what's happening with records and tapes. Let me guess. Computers, right? Right. Computers like the ones inside today's CD players will soon let us watch and even record movies on compact discs. And because of the way the information is stored, the pictures will be sharper, the sound clearer, and they won't wear out like VCR tapes either. You may think that you don't know how to use a computer, but you do. What do you mean? Well, take your CD player, for instance. It's actually a computer which uses tiny laser beams to read information from the compact disc and then convert it into music. This Digital method produces clean, clear stereo sounds with none of the scratching and hissing noises that we had with old-fashioned records. Is that what makes it stereo? No. To have stereo sound, you need at least two speakers. Each speaker plays back a different part of the music so it sounds as if the musicians were right there in front of you. Some on your left side, and some on your right. Of course, no one in his right mind would have imagined a talk and a singing machine when I was a girl way back in the middle of the last century. Who would have thought of such a thing? But that isn't to say that we didn't have our music. Why, well, walk down any street in our town on a summer evening and you'd hear the sounds of half a dozen hymns or other tunes floating out the front doors as you pass by. Every house had a piano. All the women could play. And we girls took lessons right through childhood. And when company came to call, men and women entertained themselves by gathering around the piano singing the popular songs of the day. The Victrola was the showpiece of our parlor when I was a youngster in the 20s. In the evenings, when the dinner dishes were done, we would gather around and listen to some of the greatest stars of our day right in our own home. You had to wind up the Vic and give the turntable a spin to get it started, and the sounds that came out of the megaphone were a bit tinny, but we heard music that we never heard before. And sometimes, late on a Saturday night, I'd sneak down onto the landing and see Mom and Dad with the carpet rolled off to the side of the living room, dancing to the music of the Vic. When I was little, there were all different kinds of records. 78s, 45s, and LPs, or long-playing albums. The older records were usually 78s. That meant that the records spun around on the turntable 78 times every minute. 78s were big and heavy and very easy to break. 
they could only fit one or two songs on each side. Forty-fives were what most of the kids bought. They had one song on each side, a hit song, which the radio station played, and a B-side, which nobody really listened to. You could buy them for about a dollar or so, and that's where a lot of my allowance went on Saturday afternoons. Thomas Edison invented the record player in December of 1877. He called it a phonograph, just about a year before he invented the light bulb. Why did he call it a phonograph? Well, the word means sound writer, and that's just what Edison's machine did. It took the sound waves produced by his voice and wrote them onto a tinfoil cylinder, which served as the first record. And what were the words that Tom Edison spoke into his phonograph on that historic day? I know, listen. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. Cassette tapes are different from CDs and records in one important way. Not only can you listen to music from them, but you can record sounds onto them, then listen to them later. You can record or tape records and songs from the radio, and if you have a microphone, you can even record your own voice and the voices of your friends. Our tape recorders in the 50s were fun to listen to, but they sure weren't fun to use. How come? Well, for one thing, there were no such thing as tape cassettes. The tape came on one reel, and Dad had to thread it through the tape machine and onto another reel. The tape was always breaking and getting stuck in the machine or running off the reel. I think we spent more time setting it up than we did using it. But it was great fun hearing yourself on the tape. I never thought it sounded like me, but everybody else said that it did. Pretty soon, it seems, almost every machine and instrument we use will be controlled by computers. They're in our telephones, our cars, our microwaves and refrigerators, and soon they'll be a part of our tape players, too. DAT machines, or digital audio tape players, look like cassette players, but they play music just the way a computer plays a program. And as a result, they sound as bright and clear as a compact disc. And not only that, but you can record on them, too. Time passes by us very smoothly. One minute is no shorter or longer than the next. And that simple fact has caused no end of headaches for clockmakers for hundreds of years. How come? Because it's the job of the clockmaker to make a machine that works almost as smoothly as time itself. A machine that never changes speed from one minute to the next. They've built clocks powered by falling water and falling sand and clocks that ticked off the hours using pendulums and weights and springs and even electricity. But none were as smooth as the passing minutes. But then, scientists discovered that the atoms which make up common quartz, like the sand at the beach, vibrate at a pace that simply never changes minute to minute, month to month, year to year. A quartz clock. What a perfect way to measure time. Today, you and I are used to measuring time down to the minute. We know exactly when school starts in the morning and lets out in the afternoon, when we have to be home at night, and when our favorite TV shows come on. But it didn't used to be that way. It didn't? No. For hundreds of years, folks had no use for minutes or even hours. In fact, the only clock in a village or town was likely to be found in the bell tower of the church. So time was something you heard rather than saw. The bells would chime the passing hours to remind the villagers of their morning, noon, and evening prayers. And they would toll the death of a neighbor, one bell for each year he lived. And they even sounded the alarm in case of fire or invasion. Only families with money could afford clocks in my day. I remember that our minister had a beautiful clock which sat on the mantel above the fireplace in his common room. It was made of carven wood with a painted dial. But our family? We had a sundial which stood by the back door near the vegetable garden. As the sun moved across the sky, the shadow it cast fell across one of the numbers carved into the dial and told us the time of day. The grandfather's clock standing in our hallway did more than count the hours for our family. It kept a watch on the night sky for us as well. How did it do that? 
You see, right above the face of the clock was a painted dial that moved pictures of the moon around from day to day. That way we knew when to expect a full moon, a new moon, or when it was in its first or last quarters. Now, knowing the phase of the moon may not seem that important, but for a farm family like ours, a full moon at planting or harvest meant that we could spend extra hours working in the fields, so it sure mattered to us. We had an old eight-day wind-up hanging on the wall of our parlor when I was little. It was made from cherry wood, and it had a glass door with a pendulum inside that swung back and forth. On the quietest afternoons, especially in wintertime when the windows were closed, I could hear its ticking even from the kitchen. But every 15 minutes when it chimed, you could hear it anywhere in the house. And every Sunday morning, like clockwork, my father would open the glass door and wind it up with a special key in three places. One for the time, one for the Westminster chimes, and one for the bells that told the hours. The pendulum and wind-up clocks of the old days were pretty complicated pieces of machinery with lots of gears and other moving parts inside them. But the newer electric clocks that we had in the 50s only needed a simple motor and electric current to keep time, so they got much lighter and smaller. And they also took on quite a number of different shapes. We had plastic clocks in the shape of houses and ships, and even one that looked like a cat whose tail swung back and forth like a pendulum.